What does that mean? That means that uh, we don't have a lot of the commissioners that accept it, saying that they were going to be here. Okay. How about Andy Nunn? Uh, da, 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 da. No, he did not accept. AJ Nunn at yahoo.com. I'm going to send him a text. Does he, uh, he wrote to me oh, earlier. There he goes. Andy, he's Andy here. just he's joined. Here. He's here. I'm going to go yeah. ahead and start the recording. Great. Recording in progress. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the City of Hartford Charter Revision Commission to order on Thursday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. And we will start with the roll call. Uh, David Grant, please take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So when I call your name, just please say here for the record. Uh, James Wolf. Here. Raul De Jesus Jr. Here. John Gale. Alexander Aponte. Arunan Aralumpalum. Steve Bonafonte. Vicki Gallon Clark. Present. Kamora Harrington. Kenneth Kennedy. Kathleen Kowalshin, Melvin Medina, here. Jadira Rivera, Bruce Rubenstein, here. And Eon Smith, here. Okay, you are, you do not have quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, we will move past item number two and move to. Um, we have two more members who just came on Ken Kennedy and. Yadira is here. That's eight total commissioners. And for 15, you need nah, actually eight. Eight. Yep, you're good. You have quorum now. Hey, everybody. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties. No problem. I sent out the wrong Zoom link on the agenda. So uh, I, I will take partial blame for that. Um, all right. I will entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes from February 17th, 2022. Is there a motion? So moved. The, the motion's been made by Commissioner Medina. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Rubenstein. Is there any discussion? <sighs> Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Commissioner Gallon Clark abstains for the record. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Uh, and we will go on to the chairman's report. Uh, and uh, as I've mentioned in the past, we're, we're anxiously looking forward to uh, getting back in person or, or going back to uh, some form of hybrid meeting uh, in the future. I will be having conversations uh, tomorrow about uh, our capability to do that, and we'll be in touch with commissioners next week. Um, you know, the, the positivity rates are down. I think today's numbers is down at like 2.22% uh, in the state of Connecticut. Mask mandates are being lifted, um, you know, in schools and many other areas. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's really critical that this group get together and uh, debate uh, these issues that are, are very important to the city uh, in person, uh, if we can, if at all possible. And so, um, so we'll continue to explore that. Stay tuned. I think there should be some news uh, coming up within the next week or so. Um, on to public comment, item number four. I don't see any members of the public joining us this evening. Uh, and so we can move on to item number five, uh, the discussion regarding the Office of the Treasurer. And we're going to have a presentation this evening uh, from Attorney Mednick and Andrew Nunn, who is the former CAO of the city of Bridgeport. Um, Attorney Mednick, I'll pass it over to you to provide a proper introduction for uh, Mr. Nunn and to uh, kick off the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm gonna make a few, if, if Andy doesn't mind, good seeing you, Andy. It's been a long time. It's a pleasure seeing you. Um, one of these days we'll see each other face to face. Um, I just wanna open up a little bit Give a little context and, and um, just a little background. Um, as you know, um, I prepared a uh, background document some time ago um, 
pertaining to the changes in the treasurer's office, it's background document number nine, um, that um, um, they're not substantial changes, but they are a kind of a consolidation of the, all the provisions pertaining to the uh, treasurer and pensions to be moved into uh, chapter six, which uh, is currently called all elective offices, and it would be re-titled re, uh, the city treasurer. Um, and in that section, it would, would address um, all, of the, all of the issues involving the, um, uh, the role of the city treasurer in the city of Hartford. Um, one of the things we were hoping to do tonight, um, and Andy's going to be helpful to us in, in that regard, was to try to set a context for the office of the treasurer in the city of Hartford. Um, there are just about 20 elected treasurers in the state of Connecticut. Um, in um, the, the city's population um, of 31,000 and above, there are seven. There's only one full-time treasurer. Um, elected treasurer in the state of Connecticut, and that is the treasurer of the city of Hartford. Uh, many of the treasurers uh, in the state um, have check signing capacity, have some budget um, role uh, and roles in bonding uh, in, the, in the front side of the bonding process, um, signing certain documents uh, that go out uh, from the city to the, uh, uh, to the bond agencies and to the uh, prospective um, purchasers of bonds for the municipality. Uh, but the role we have in Hartford is quite unique. Uh, there are some part-timers, is some investment responsibility, but um, the office is comprised of uh, a part-time treasurer, maybe a full-time deputy treasurer, um, and they rely on outside consultants. There is no uh, office with an elected official in charge of the office that has the uh, broad responsibilities that the treasurer of the city of Hartford uh, has um, uh, in, in his or her portfolio, right now his portfolio. Um, during the course of my due diligence in trying to put um, a backgrounder together uh, for, um, for us, once I found that we had no place in the state of Connecticut to look, I found an organization called the Association of Public Treasurers of the United States and Canada. Um, it's an organization that's based somewhere in Illinois. And I had multiple um, discussions with Shelley Burrish, who is the director of the organization. And she did a, a real serious search around the country. Uh, I figured um, maybe some of the larger cities might have them and uh, felt that if there was a treasurer in Detroit, it really didn't compare to what we are in Hartford. Um, there might've been a couple of the larger cities where there was elected treasurers, but where there are elected treasurers and they are full-time, uh, they were in states where pension funds were managed by the state and not by local government. And therefore th it was not an apples to apples comparison. Uh, so again, um, found a kind of a, a roadblock in terms of trying to find some good people who could speak uh, to, um, uh, to, um, provide further background. So what I decided to do is I, I decided that uh, one of the approaches that we could take to this is to take a look at the functions of the treasurer's office and what the treasurer does and what better a person to have uh, than somebody who was a first selectman um, in, a, in a town, the town of Monroe, uh, Connecticut, um, a board member of MIRA, of CCM, of KERMA, of cost, those are all the organizations that are involved in the um, uh, policy and operational aspects, um, best practices for municipalities. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't somehow interface with GFOA and didn't put that on his list. He's probably uh, um, connected with them as, all, as well. And was a CAO of the largest city in the state of Connecticut, Chief Administrative Officer of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And so I thought that it was important to have somebody who had an, an idea of the breadth of the, the financial uh, aspects of this office, how it's done uh, in Bridgeport and probably other uh, major municipalities to really help set a context for what, um, what we have in Hartford and how Hartford works, uh, which is different, unique, but I think that the, the work that the treasurer does 
is work that's done in other uh, cities by other people. So it's my pleasure uh, and, uh, to introduce my good friend. I worked pretty closely with him uh, during the Finch years. Many of you remember we had Mayor Finch um, entertain us about two months ago or three months ago. He was absolutely terrific um, uh, uh, witness uh, talking about boards of education, which Andy knows was a very important issue to, to the mayor at the time. Uh, and Andy and I also share uh, a, a love for music. Um, he does it professionally. Got mail. Uh, he he uh, does it professionally now. He's the general manager of the Hartford Healthcare Amphitheater in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, which is a, uh, uh, a really terrific venue. Um, and um, I don't run a venue, but I'm the attorney for a venue in, in New Haven called the Westville Music Bowl. So Andy and I uh, share our professional curiosities and interests in government and our love for music, and he's doing it full time, and I'm envious of him. So I'd like to introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Andy Nunn, to talk about the treasurer. Hi, and, and thank you for having me. And um, thank you, Steve, for inviting me. Um, Steve and I you know, talked about this um, the other day. And, you know, so I can give you some background that I know. Um, I'm you know, not an expert in all these things, but uh, had a lot of experience. Um, and what is interesting to me, uh, or, or the difference, let me, let me say this, the difference between the, the city of Bridgeport and the city of Hartford in terms of the treasurer's office is that in Bridgeport, the treasurer is an, is a appointed official um, treasurer works. And this is kind of, to me, this is always sort of gave me um, pause or it could be a, it's a little, uh, could be a conflict of interest. So the treasurer reports up the, the chain to the um, finance director um, Whereas, and so that, it, it, it could potentially be seen as a conflict of interest at times. Um, an elected treasurer is independent and reports directly to the voters, obviously through checks and balances, works you know, with the common council or, or the council, works with, um, you know, it's depending of uh, different offices and the mayor. Um, so, but if you, in Bridgeport, if you looked at the mayor as a chief executive officer then down to me when I was a chief administrative officer to the finance director, and then you have the treasurer. So um, an elected official, in my mind, was always something better um, for cities, especially for bigger cities. When I was in a different capacity in a smaller town, Monroe, our treasurer was elected, but part time and really relied on input from uh, our finance director and our in our bond council and things along those lines. So but in Bridgeport, um, I looked at what's being proposed that Steve gave me um, as far as the duties and things like that, very similar to what, uh, what was done in, in Bridgeport. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the same duties and responsibilities. So that's not different. It's just that um, the treasurer was within the finan finance department, uh, had a deputy treasurer. Uh, when we had times where the treasurer uh, left to take another job, or we actually had a, a former treasurer eventually make her way up to being the finance director. When a treasurer left the office, the finance director could not be an acting treasurer. An acting treasurer would have to be appointed uh, from so either some other department or from without, you know, without outside the city. So, um, but to me, the unique thing uh, in Hartford is, is that you're, the, the position is elected. And I think a lot of times, uh, as I've seen through the years being involved in government and when you're working uh, and through the boards and commissions that I was on statewide, a lot of times elected officials, and you guys <laughs> probably know this as elected officials, uh, get a bad rap, like you're an elected official, but you're not uh, an expert. And so sometimes when you see positions such as a treasurer or, or things like that, um, people kind of take pause. Uh, but it appears to me that the what you have here uh, is a very detailed uh, organization and job uh, description. And, and I'm talking to Steve, this is already being done. Um, and so to me, that, that is probably one of the best models for a bigger city. What I also thought was interesting um, is how you're arranging the pay scale. So in the city of Bridgeport, we have a grid, a pay grid uh, that is uh, goes into effect. So we have for our elected officials, 
Uh, it's what, except for the common council, it's four years. So for the mayor, uh, the city clerk, the town clerk, uh, those kind of offices, it's a four year term. So the, the grid for payment grid for them goes into effect every four years. Uh, and those are those elected officials. And with that, the grid, or excuse me, it goes into effect every two years. The, the four-year elected officials can't move. So when they take a, when they take, they're elected to the job, their pay stays the same, but the grid moves every two years. So for instance, um, uh, I, as a CAO was, I was under the four-year thing, but my, some of my staff could move within the grid, but that was set. It wasn't set to a, um, a specific thing like a, a judge. Uh, which, which you guys have a salary like that. Um, it was set to comparable salaries. And then once it did, it just sort of went up um, a certain percentage each, uh, each two years. Um, but I think that's also an interesting thing because the job of the treasurer to me is, is one of the most important jobs uh, in a city. Obviously, when you combine the mayor, the council, and the, and the treasurer, those are three key positions for the city government, if not be three key positions. And when you're talking about fiduciary management, when you're talking about, uh, you know, over, overseeing the pension funds and, and those kind of things, um, it's, it's a huge. In Bridgeport, the treasurer would convene the, uh, the pension committee, which would have a number of various department people and then people from outside the city, as well as uh, consultants and attorneys on that. But that was always a, you know, as you guys, as you guys know, it's cities and the pensions and those kinds of things are uh, always critical and always uh, something that needs to be looked at closely. So I don't know, Steve, if you want to prompt me or if somebody wants to ask me questions or if you want to hear more. I mean, that's my basic overview of what I think. But, but uh, I like the model that you guys have here. It would be something, you know, I hate to say it in the city of Bridgeport, but to me, it's a little better model having an elected treasurer who's a little more independent. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, I'll defer back to the chair um, so that members of the commission can ask questions. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah, why don't we open it up for questions. If folks have questions for Andy, they can use the raised hand function and I'll call on you in the order that I see you. I see Commissioner Rubenstein has raised his hand. Uh, Commissioner Rubenstein, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Nunn. Um, I gather some of your meetings might have been at Ralph and Richard's, a famous restaurant there in Bridgeport. <laughs> well, when Steve, when I met with Steve and he was there, he asked if he was paying. <laughs> or, no, or, <laughs> uh, or Testos on Madison Ave. <laughs> I was not a Testo person, which is a, <laughs> says why I'm not working there anymore. <laughs> Only kidding. Yeah. Uh, so you would agree that the position of treasurer in Hartford is sui generis? Yeah. Okay. And have you had a chance to, uh, Ms. Attorney Mendick sent you the um, uh, code and an ordinances empowering the treasurer in Hartford and, and what the, the treasurer's powers are at the present? Yes, he did. And I reviewed him. And, and like I said, I, like I, I might have not made myself clear, it, those, the duties are very similar to what the duties uh, I've seen in Bridgeport and other bigger cities as a treasurer, the unique thing is that it's elected, but and the duties and responsibilities. You testified that the treasurer in Bridgeport's appointed. Correct. I assume by the council and then the mayor has to either agree or veto it? No, it's a, it's a mayoral appointment. Oh, it's a mayoral appointment. Yeah, oh. so the, generally the finance director makes the recommendation and then the mayor would appoint. I don't want to hog all the time, but I just want to ask one question. Um, in your professional opinion, Mr. Nunn, do you think it's better for purposes of um, um, transparency, honesty, and integrity to have a treasurer that's elected by the voters or appointed by a mayor or appointed by a council? I actually believe it should be elected um, because I think there's potential for conflict when it's appointed. Great. Thank you very much. No further questions. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Rubenstein. Uh, Commissioner Gallen-Clark, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, through you. Mr. Nunn, would you expound a little bit more on how salaries are arrived from your experience for that position of treasurer? 
Right. So the city um, of Bridgeport had a pay, a pay grid. They still do. Uh, and the grid was based upon your roles and responsibilities. So at the top of the grid for the municipal side, uh, we were separate from the Board of Ed, but the municipal side would have the mayor. Um, and then there would be a level, uh, if you want, it wasn't the A level, but if you consider like the A level and then the B level would be, um, you had the chief administrative officer and then just a sort of a B subdivision would be the police chief and fire chief. And then you would have B department heads like finance, uh, budget director, and then right below that would be the treasurer. So the treasurer's salary was comparable uh, to the mayoral salary, but it was not as uh, as high as the mayor's salary, or, or you know, they, they, they weren't really high salaries, to be honest. But they uh, wasn't at, you know wasn't the same. But it would go, uh, it would increase um, as the grid increased. Uh, like I said, in, for well, it wasn't elected a position, so for an appointed position such as a treasurer, it could increase every two years. And the council, the common council would review that and during uh, budget time approve that or not approve it. Uh, and there had been years when that was not approved, but uh, mm -hmm. generally it was. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Smith. Chair, through you, um, I, I know that um, <clears throat> Mr. Dunn testified that or stated that uh, the duties are similar. Uh, is there any pension fund management by the treasurer uh, of, of Bridgeport? Yes, there is. Okay, and and is that something that when it's done, uh, it requires the approval of the mayor, or the mayor is involved in that process? There is, yes, there is a pension committee. There's a committee that oversees uh, the pension, um, and it's, in, it's comprised of the mayor. I, you know, I, again, I don't have it all in front of me, but the, it's the, it was the mayor, obviously the treasurer, um, finance director, and then you would have, uh, they would have some outside um, consultants who were involved in, in that in pension, and we, we would hire a firm to help manage the pension fund. And so they would advise that committee. There would be obviously there would be a uh, there'd be a member of the uh, the council as well. The treasurer also, in regards to the pension, uh, would interact regularly with the council. Uh, the council had a subcommittee, uh, a budgetary subcommittee, which then also had uh, a committee, sort of that was comprised of members of the budgetary subcommittee. Uh, that would uh, help work on the pension or oversee it. So it was kind of, we had a pension committee, they would make the ultimate recommendations and any final decision would be brought forth by the mayor and then it would need to be approved by the city council. Okay, and so um, in, in terms of, of, of a situation in which uh, the treasurer and the mayor agree uh, disagree under that system, the mayor would have the final say. Am I understanding that correctly? The pension committee would make their final recommendation. So theoretically, with the members on the pension committee, the mayor could be vetoed on that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. yep. Uh, and just to uh, just one uh, add, add on to that, that's why I feel with an elected official, it's a little better uh, because theoretically, up the uh, municipal uh, chain at the end of the day when you're appointed, at least in the way Bridgeport is, that's also your ultimate boss that you're <laughs> vetoing at a meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Do you have any other questions from members of the commission? Steve? Do you have uh, can, yeah, can I just make one point, a um, little color commentary on Andy's last point. Uh, because the treasurer is um, accountable to officials above uh, him or her in Bridgeport, the finance director and ultimately the mayor, has a relationship with the pension com commission, the elected independence that Andy was talking about with the Hartford treasurer really puts the Hartford Treasurer in more of a fiduciary relationship. Um, certainly the mayor has appointments to the 
pension commission, so can play a role there. But the mayor doesn't have anything to say about the treasurer's functioning operations, doesn't provide a, um, a review of the treasurer's uh, record, has no role with the treasurer on a personnel level that's really up to the voters. Uh, and so the treasurer's sole responsibility is really a fiduciary responsibility, uh, both to the taxpayers as an elected official and to the pension commission. In effect, it's the pension commission that the treasurer really reports to from an administrative point of view, uh, because they have the ultimate fiduciary responsibility for the pension. And the council, of course, has a, a role in funding the pension uh, as well. But I wanted to, I wanted to underscore that point um, that, is, that really is the distinction between Bridgeport, Waterbury, New Haven, um, and then uh, Stanford, and then Hartford, just looking at the largest cities in the state, um, just to make that point. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Any other questions from members of the commission? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Nunn. Uh, and thank you to Steve uh, for putting together this, this conversation. Um, the treasurer's position here in Hartford is so unique uh, and he did yeoman's work trying to understand how the rest of the uh, you know, the municipalities here in uh, Connecticut worked and uh, to see if there are any comparable municipalities across the, the country. Um, and, uh, and so we just really appreciate the work that uh, you both put into this conversation. And, uh, and, uh, and I thought it was a great panel. So thank you both. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking with you. Good luck. See you soon, Andy. Andy. Thank you. See you, Steve. Yep. Bye. All right, we'll now move on to item number six, which is a preliminary discussion regarding the Court of Common Council. Uh, and this is an offshoot from our conversation over the past uh, two meetings. Uh, and so, you know, during those meetings, we heard a lot about different structures for municipal legislative bodies, different election cycles, different ways to provide for staffing of those uh, legislative bodies. And it was uh, you know, I think it was very interesting, very helpful to um, give us some context for our conversations going forward. Uh, and I know there are going to be some ideas potentially about changes uh, to how we operate here with regards to the city council. Uh, and now is most certainly the time to do that if you have some ideas. Uh, that being said, uh, I want to help, I, I want to frame the conversation um, carefully tonight. So if you're going to make a, a propose a charter revision this evening, when it comes to structure, composition, staffing, I'd ask that uh, before you offer the proposed revision that you identify the specific problem uh, with our current structure that you're trying to address with your charter revision. Um, and then if you have, if you're of the opinion that nothing should be changed, uh, you know, and, and you want to offer that up, uh, ask you, provide the rationale for that as well. Um, and so this will be a, a prelim, preliminary conversation um, and uh, there'll be no voting or anything tonight. And uh, as we have in the past, I'd ask that folks use the raise hand function. I'll call on you in the order that I see you. Um, and just for housekeeping, let's keep everything going through the chair. Um, so there's no crosstalk um, and we can keep the conversation civil. So I saw Commissioner Kennedy raise his hand first and then Commissioner Rubenstein raised his hand second. Uh, so we will now go to Commissioner Kennedy, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this previously and I may have talked to some other folks about this. The, the problem with the Court of Common Council today is it's tied to the mayor. Um, the council is elected with the mayor at the same time as citywide elections. No individual councilman really raises sufficient funds to be quote unquote elected on their own. Um, you know, when I served, I did feel I was elected on my own, but at the same time, I think that was a minority viewpoint. Uh, most people felt they owed their political allegiance to the mayor. Um, since you've got a strong mayor form of government, and you know that, that 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 was the same way before the mayor became a strong mayor. Mike Peters, when Mike Peters was mayor in the council form of government, um, was very powerful in the sense that again he got people elected. 
and people felt they owed Mike Peters a great deal. But that council was invested with all the power of the government. So there was a balance there, even though the mayor and everyone felt they owed the mayor their political lives, council had all that power. Now, after 2000, when we elected a mayor Perez, that all completely changed. Not only did the mayor get you elected, raise the money, um, he now had all the power or she. And the council, uh, which had some budgetary power, um, you know, just felt that, you know, they owed their lives to the mayor. The mayor had all the power. So basically it became a very compliant body. Um, too compliant, in my opinion. Um, all the legislative bodies and political uh, structures at, at this local level, you're going to have an 80 to 90 percent agreement. But what you can't have is people completely um, not following their responsibilities. I use my request one time for council uh, budget information, some other stuff within City Hall. And I actually had to sue Mayor Perez before the Freedom of Information Commission. <laughs> to get the information that was requested because he wasn't gonna provide it because I wasn't playing ball with him. Now, yeah, you know, some people say, well, you know, that, you know, that's unusual circumstances, things can change. Yes, but there was entirely abuses of power. Um, we had things submitted from individual council people that if they didn't have the mayor's signature sign off on them, he had, you know, you couldn't even get them heard on the floor of the council at the time. Um, now we subsequently elected other people um, that had a change when Matt Ritter and John Bazano, some other folks got elected down the line a bit. Council became a little bit more uh, uh, less compliant, but the power structure is just too unequal. And so at some point you have to address that inequality um, between the power of the executive and the legislator. If you want to have a true legislator functioning form of government. The other thing I thought was troublesome um, and, 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 and this has really nothing to do with the election that, that we lost um, uh, with, uh, with Pedro, was when they cleared out every one of the city council. Um, you heard too much information about there was no institutional memory had been preserved. Um, I think people made the right call. I think the people always do. But you want to try to preserve at some point institutional memory. <laughs> you know, when the councils cleared out and the staffs all cleared out at the same time, um, you know, it takes people a little bit of time to figure out, you know, well, the basics, you know, how to function, um, how to organize yourselves, probably even where the key of the restroom is, that type of thing. Um, and that was all cleared out in one election. I thought that was bad for the city, uh, at least initially for about, so, so we say, six months or so. Um, and so those are the two things I'd like to address when it comes to council. Uh, the proposal that I've often thought about, and it's also based in the reality of politics in that you have right now three seats for the minority party. They're not going to give those up. <laughs> You're not going to be able to reduce that down to two or one or what, you know, they're, they're going to want their guaranteed three seats. And the last council um, or the last revision, uh, char revision, we had a proposal for hybrid, but it was 11 seats. That was, I believe, six, uh, six districts, no, no, five, it was either six, five or five, six, but either way, the Working Families Party was losing a seat. In the end, they did not support that going to the public. So I would propose probably enlarging the council to um, 15, keeping your same nine at large, adding six districts. The minority party would be, would be preserving their, their three seats guaranteed in the at-large election. You would have six districts that would closely, closely mirror to some degree the district we have now for state elections. Those are the most competitive elections. Um, and I would propose separating the elections of the at-large council and the district council, having the districts run with the mayor. Because at that point, the mayor can't say to somebody in the district, I got you elected. It's like the mayor saying to Brandon McGee or Matt Ritter, I got you elected because I raised some money for you. Well, they can laugh that off. Think, I won my own district and I've raised my own money. Um, and district elections are small enough where the endorsement of the party will not be all controlling. Right now, you are uh, if you survive the Democratic Party um, 
uh, I'll call it the uh, the nomination process, you survive that and you get nominated, you're tantamount to elected. I, I've lived in the city 30 years and I time for that. No person who's received the Democratic Party nomination for city council has lost an election. That's just a fact. Um, the closest someone came, I think, is when uh, I came within 60 votes of R. Joe Lynch in election. Um, generally speaking, um, it just does not happen, um, even in primaries, where the endorsed Democrats lose. Um, that might have happened in Kerry's days, Bruce. I don't know. You can let me know. But I mean, I just don't remember seeing anyone receiving the Democrat Party nomination has lost an election in the last 30 odd years. Um, that's not good either. But if you break it into districts, you can make those elections fairly competitive and people can get after it. You don't want the districts to be too, too large. I've heard, you know, divided up into thirds. Um, no, um, you, want, you want the districts to be as small as you can, not being too small, but not being too big. And you want someone to be able to, to take on the Democratic Party in those elections. Um, I think that can happen uh, in, um, in the current makeup of council in some of those districts. Right now we have five people, maybe six, with outside, going outside of uh, either the South End and Weathersfield or Windsor to make up, you know, the six uh, districts for the city of Hartford. Um, without going to outside districts, our our um, divisions could be slightly smaller and even, and even more competitive um, and give a real challenge to the majority party. Um, and then once they're elected with the mayor, the mayor can't say to those people, you know, I own you, which is what generally happens after the <laughs> at large elections. And then I would have a, what I would call a city election where the register of voters, the board of ed, the council running at large, um, and if I'm missing an office, would all run together. And if we went to police commission, went to a commissioner form for public safety, right, for police and fire. I'd have them all run at the same time in a citywide election, trying to boost the number of voters that you would get for the Board of Ed, right? Because so the Board of Ed and the um, registered voters are really poor turnout elections. Um, very, a lot of people don't even think about them because they think, oh, what's, what's the point? But if you're running them with the majority of the council at large, I think you're going to get a lot, of, a lot more interest. The board will be running at large at the same time, too. That will help everyone raise those, those dollars. Um, and if we make the public safety a, a focal point of that by turning it over to a commission form you know, system for, uh, for the police and fire, I think you'll have a lot of interest in those elections. And you'll also have a lot of people running at the same time. Um, and I think that could solve some, one of our problems, which has been getting enough people out to vote. Mayoral elections, you generally get a fair number of folks out. And definitely if they're running in um, um, you know, well, in the time they're running. I'd also make the, t uh, the elections every two years. So everyone still serves their four-year term, but it's every two years. And so the council is the body that never dies. Um, you have the uh, mayor and the at-large people running. I mean, the mayor, excuse me, and the district's running. They run for four years. And then in, right, two years into that, you'd have the city election and they would run for four years. And those terms would then keep flipping over, but you would have constant feedback to the city council and to the municipal government every two years. I think that's what people miss. Um, I remember back in the days of uh, Trudy, <laughs> um, Bob Jackson, Abe, those folks, and I know some of, you, some of the people here know those folks. I think they miss those elections every two years because they thought when the ship wasn't running right, they wanted to be able to correct it. But the four-year term does allow people to make some decisions without always worrying about being reelected. So if you still have the feedback every two years, you still accomplish the same goal uh, in my mind. Um, realize I talked a little bit long, <laughs> um, but I have put some thought into this over a number of years is what's the best way um, for the council, for the legislative body to be well, not just stronger, not, and not to be a, a, a block on the mayor's power, but just to balance the mayor's power out. Um, one final point, because it now takes a million dollars to be mayor of City of Hartford. Um, essentially, poor communities have been priced out of the mayor's office. Um, it, 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 it sometimes makes me sick 
That's not what was intended when we went to strong mayor form of government, but that's what has occurred. Um, I remember when we thought Mike Peters raising $100,000 was, you know, was just crazy. <laughs> His last election, he raised three. Um, Eddie's first election, he raised a little over 350, 400. And then a losing candidate, Perez, I mean, not Perez, uh, Segarra, raised almost $700,000. But the winning candidate raised well over a million. I think it was like a million, two, million, three. I mean, for a job that pays one hundred fifty to one hundred seventy thousand dollars, no one does it for the pay. I, I, I grant you. But what people from poor communities are going to be able to raise that kind of money to be the chief executive city officer of the city? So at some point, you have to balance that power out. You have to that, that money um, has to be balanced out with the voice of the folks of the people. And when you have elections that are take up that are too big, um, you 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 know people can't fight, or the, the fight's not fair, in my opinion. Um, so those are the three basic reasons I'd like to see a, a change in the um, on the council. Um, it's a, I think in the end it'll be a better legislative body that will give more people a chance to rise up, and they won't have to always work themselves through the Democratic Party process. You know, there's a long line for Democrats um, to work their way through both the town, uh, town committee, boards and commissions, the council. I'm not saying that's bad, but sometimes the party does need to be challenged. And this would at least allow the party to be challenged and for it to be more honest to the people it represents. Thank you so much. Steve? I have a technical question for uh, Commissioner Kennedy, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, sure. You were talking about the registrars. I think the registrars are elected in the state cycle. I don't think they're uh, elected in the municipal cycle. And I was looking in the charter, and as I was doing that, and I want to ask everybody, uh, maybe Ken knows this, uh, do we still have constables? There are constables in the charter. Do we elect constables? Yes. yes. <laughs> we do. Yes. yes. And they serve a function, they serve a function with the probate courts. As I understand it, because I just researched this for another town. They no serve but, papers for lawyers. They serve, they serve local papers. Yes, within the city. So we. Well, so if they can. They, if they if they start their service within the city, they can go outside. Uh, right. The only reason I know this is because Abe Giles is a very good friend of mine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when he was living in Abe, I, Abe, I was curious because oh. the constables are another local elected official. That's. Uh, and I, and I would have all that in the local in the in the local election. I did not mean to discount uh, that. Um, I was just trying to clarify. It. I want everybody to understand that there's one more office that uh, would form a cycle somewhere. So uh, and I the city as as are in the state cycle. So are you sure about that? Because I mean, we have registered votes all the time, and they never get more than two thousand votes. And it could, it could not have been what the state cycle when the governor was running. I'll take a look. I believe they're elected in the state cycle. Okay, I mean, we, we, I they're not they're not listed in the charter as being in the municipal cycle. That's why. Okay, the it. last time we read registered voters, I remember we had our registered voters get elected with barely two thousand votes hmm. citywide. It was a special election, possibly. No, no, that was um, um, that would have been when Shirley Surgeon, current councilwoman, was challenging Olga. Oh gosh, not Thanks, a, thank you. Olga Vasquez. I'm getting old, Bruce. I almost forgot Olga's last name. Um, and I, I mean, that was, I mean, that was crazy. I don't think Gigi got elected with any much more than two or 3,000 votes. Right. Um, they and they may be in the municipal cycle, but by statute. Uh, I'll, I'll double check that. That's all. Okay. So, right. so that, that was my only question. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, I wrestled long and hard with the best proper democracy within the municipality. And for me, um, it's that the three branches of government, the council, the mayor, and the treasurer should be roughly equal. Um, having said that, uh, what I'd like to see with respect to changes within the council Mira uh, Kens, um, I think there's a problem of A, the typical resident not knowing A, who to call, should the lights in the street go out, should the snow not be removed, uh, should there be uh, 
other issues. The 14 of us, 12 of us here tonight, all know that we can call certain people within the city hall and get things done. But the average citizen does not. So I think the way to make citizenship more meaningful and the city more meaningful would be to go to a hybrid district uh, at large type of election. Secondly, we suffer from a cancer. There is a cancer in our democracy in Hartford. The cancer has caused low voting. In the last elections, the average council person, I believe, got about 7,000 votes. There's about 65,000 electors that are eligible to vote when you add in everything. And the percentage of voting, even for the mayor, was abysmal. The last election that we had for the Board of Ed uh, offered a total vote roughly of about 4.6%. So my thoughts were that if you do nothing or change minimal things or just change around the edges, you're not going to get any change with respect to citizen participation. You can't have the same thing and expect a different result. I think the way to get a better voting result is to offer more roles for people, to get people excited about these roles, to get people excited about their government. So after a long and hard discussion with myself and talking to my lawyer wife and talking to my two lawyer children, who uh, are functioning active uh, Democrats. Um, I'm, in, I'm in favor of going to uh, what the attorney Kennedy suggests, which is a 15 member hybrid system in which nine are at large and six are district, which means that we would have to have an apportionment committee, which will have to be built into the charter and that the at large uh, of nine, the state statute would um, mandate that the uh, minority parties would have at least three there with the possibility since the there would be districts if they compete very hard and utilize their resources very well with the possibility of obtaining even, even more. But that's not my really major issue with, 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 uh, with this. The major issue is increasing voting and increasing citizen participation and getting citizens to understand their government and what to do if certain things within their neighborhood uh, need help. Furthermore, I totally agree with, with Attorney Kennedy with respect to um, bifurcating the election so that the mayor um, doesn't seem to be dominating the, the council. I understand that different types of people run for different offices. And sometimes you get very obsequious people running for councils. And uh, an obsequious person is going to fall in line, unfortunately. But if a person is not obsequious and of a, of a strong mind and character, then I think the a way to do the elections is exactly what attorney Kennedy said. He and I came to kind of the same place without talking to each other, I might add. And I do want to mention that this is not uh, a situation in which we conspired. But uh, I'm glad to see that he and I came out exactly at the same area with this. With respect to police commissioners that he mentioned, just as an afterthought, I'm in favor of elected district police commissioners, um, but it has to be finessed because we have things in the city now that other cities do not have. And, and with the respect to the board, I will get to that later, but I wanna thank you for allowing me the time, but that's exactly where I am. It's uh, similar to, very similar to attorney Kennedy uh, and for, somewhat similar reasons. Thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner Rubenstein. And I saw that uh, Commissioner Medina raised his hand. Yeah, I, I won't uh, take up folks time. I, I'm in strong agreement with, uh, with Commissioner Kennedy and Commissioner Rubenstein for very similar reasons. I think kind of a friendly amendment on my part would be, I think part of the issue of solving turnout is actually shifting. I, I'm in agreement with four year terms cycled so that you have a portion running, you know, every two years. Uh, but that I actually don't think that those election cycles should be on both on years and off years and not currently in the municipal odd year cycle. Um, so you would have, you know, for example, mayor running in 2019, uh, uh, doing his, his or her four year term, but in even years, every, you know, every two years you're having the council, uh, the council uh, being elected. Uh, and the reason being, I think that that is the truly kind of separating the mayor's election from everyone that's getting elected in, uh, in council. And you then have the benefit that the council is running with likely a statewide race, which will increase turnout. Uh, so I think that the division there between the mayor and the city council is a, a bit cleaner um, than, than, than if you have a mayor running on cycle. I, you know, I'm looking forward in further dis in, in further of our meetings to talk about the the district component. Uh, I'm in strong strong favor of it. I actually the one the one difference is I think that the the size of the or the number of districts should be more than the at large seats. But I understand the concern around the minority party component. I think it's something that as a commission, I I would love to actually invite them back to have a maybe more honest conversation about where their concerns are. Uh, to you know. I don't want to be drafting a charter on the perception of, of fear that they might not get support without just having that conversation directly, I guess, is what I'm saying there. Um, I have other thoughts, but that I'll introduce in, in, in further sessions. But I just wanted to, you know, uh, uh, share my agreement with Commissioner Kennedy and Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you, Commissioner Medina. And Steve, I have a question. Can, can municipal um, officials run on the, on the state years, the even years? No, uh, I was just raising my hand. Uh, you anticipated the, the comment. Um, unless we have a statutory change, we have municipal election years and, and state and federal election years. So we would not be able to do that. Okay. Um, and, and so, and then, so a, a special, some kind of special act change would also be required for ranked choice voting for nonpartisan elections um, and for public financing of elections. That is correct. Okay, I just want to put that all out there. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I think it's important to come up. Yeah, and, okay. you and you can't have recall elections and you can't have term limits. So oh, let's put them all out there. <laughs> okay, all right, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, okay, any other, any other ideas for charter revisions? No one has mentioned staffing yet. Um, I want to open that up as well if people have thoughts on staffing. Okay, I don't see any. Um, for the Commissioner Rubenstein, do you have another comment? Oh, with regard to staffing, are uh, you entertaining discussion with regard to staffing? Yeah, so on our, that's the second, uh, the second or sub, sub, sub item B, I don't know, uh, under section six is professional staffing and budget analysts. So um, yeah, that's part of the conversation this evening if we're, if we're uh, you know, gonna move on from structure and composition of council. Um, so I'll go to Commissioner Rubenstein first because he raised his hand first when, it, when I brought up staffing and then we'll go to Commissioner Gallon Clark, Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you. Um, once again, I believe in three strong branches of government in Hartford, all being roughly equal. Uh, we have seen over the last 20 years, the mayor's staff grow, uh, and he or she has uh, quite a staff now, much more, two or three times more than what it was when we first enacted the strong mayor form of government. Consequently, we have seen on the council side much less staff, uh, each person, each council person, all nine used to have their own aide, 
They do not anymore. Some of them share up. Um, so what I guess what I'm saying is at a, um, there is a disadvantage with regard to staff and getting appropriate information. And I wish that either uh, Attorney Kennedy or, or uh, Raul or, or if Alex is here, speak to this because they were actually on the council uh, and could, could speak to this. But I think that the information gathering with respect to one branch of government is, much, is better than it is with respect to the other branch of government. So what I'd like to see with regard to staffing uh, in the council's office is um, professional staff there. Uh, some of the, all the panel members uh, that we heard from mentioned that they had pretty much professional staff. I, I think it should be a robust staff, uh, not one or two members, but uh, as much as the council would need to, to function at a, at a level roughly equivalent to the other two branches of government. Uh, I also think they're gonna need a full-time budget analyst to uh, work the budget, which is a long and laborious process. And they have nobody, but the mayor's office has the CFO, the finance department, uh, and as much other help as they, as they may need. I also think, and people have mentioned, uh, a council for the council. Um, uh, one or two commissioner, commissioners here have mentioned it uh, at various times, and the city did have it for several years in the form of uh, attorney Alan Taylor, who left, I believe he was, a, well, he turned to, at a certain age and decided that uh, he was better off not being council for the council. I think the city government has evolved with respect to the council and the additional hours that they have, that they do need. And it's something we should discuss uh, and, and investigate a council for the council. So that's, uh, that's my position for a council for the council, a budget, full-time budget analyst that we've talked about before, professional staff equivalent to a staff of the other uh, positions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Rubenstein. Commissioner Galen Clark. Yes, through you, Chair, I wanted to ask, because this is really going back to the composition of the City Council. Can I still speak on that subject? Absolutely. Okay, great. I do agree in theory with Commissioner Kennedy, Commissioner Rubenstein, and what Commissioner Medina said as well. I remember back in April of 2021 that um, Ken Green actually came and spoke and he actually recommended um, 15, increasing the number of city council members to 15. And going back and listening to the meeting from February 17th and looking at the minutes, it appears that every panel, it looks like I missed a great panel discussion, um, Attorney Mitnick, but it seems like every town or city had at least 15 council members from looking at the, the minutes. So I, I do agree with increasing the numbers, what I've heard, and I also perceive that their people didn't feel that they, in Hartford, that they're adequately represented. And so that would be one problem. The other problem would be, again, um, city council members being beholden to the mayor. That's a perception and observation as well. And so at that time, it was 15 that he had recommended, and he also recommended two council people per district. Uh, so that's something that I, I would hope that we would explore in depth. The other thing is that at one point we had a discussion or, or maybe a panel where we talked about the possibility of considering city council members being full-time. I've had a chance to talk to several city council members and they talked about the weight that's on them. They're working full time and they don't have enough time to really sufficiently deal with the, the matters of the city. So that's something else that I wanna throw out for discussion as well. I think that's it for now. Okay, great. Any other um, ideas for revisions or problems that folks feel need to be addressed? 
Okay. Um, I just want to, and this is for, this is kind of for conversation purposes to play devil's advocate uh, and just to, just to create a dialogue here. Um, but when I think we had Paul Pernaruski stated that when they took the mayor off of, so they do, the mayor is on four-year terms, then council's on two-year terms. And the, the year that it was just council running, um, I think their, their thoughts were that the mayor wouldn't be on the ballot and there would be, if it's a district elections and there would be, uh, those folks wouldn't be beholden to the mayor. And uh, what he shared is that turnout was lower in those elections and competition was lower as well. And there weren't, there, there weren't as many primaries. That's the sense that I got. Um, thoughts on that and, and, you know, cause that's, to me, that's the only other, that's the only data that we can take in um, to kind of compare what's going on here at Hartford too. So um, Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, but I don't think they had a city election that we're, we're talking about proposing. We're, 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 we're talking about putting the council, the board of ed, potentially the police, Commission, you know, assuming we go that route, all on one election um, for municipal government. Right now, we have several small municipal elections. Uh, not, I mean, council and the registered voters don't run the same election cycle. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but, they, but they don't. Um, and and I think there's another group of elections, and the board of ed runs differently from the city council. Um, and again, that. I think it causes one confusion among the average voter, to be quite honest. Um, heck, I'm, I'm in, you know, have been involved. And I still don't think that's um, the best way to do things. Um, and so if we're concerned about voter turnout, I, I, that's why I'm thinking if you have a city election and you put all those offices together, I think people are going to be involved because you're not just talking about city council and or city government. You're talking about the board of ed. So you're going to get all those folks that normally are just concerned, maybe board of ed, maybe those people are just concerned for council. They're all going to be together at one time. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, will ratchet up voter turnout. I think Commissioner Medina is correct. It would be nice if we had these elections on, on the even years um, when the mayor, uh, when the governor was running, when the president was running. But that would be my preference. Um, I am aware of what the state, you know, mandates and we can't change that. You know, if, if they did allow us to change it, I would gladly make that make that change. Um, but since we have to work with what we've got, um, that's why I believe separating the mayor, having his election separate with those folks running districts at that time, um, the mayor is not going to be so concerned with individual districts. He's more concerned about his city election, you know, uh, election citywide. And depending on how the minority party does their resources, I mean, those those. Um, and how those district lines are drawn, those could be very, very competitive elections, um, particularly depending on the district. Um, and I think that's what we're looking for. I mean, right now the Democratic Party just walks. <laughs> um, it, it almost doesn't matter who the Democratic Party nominates. You know, they just they just walk. Um, and that's not good for anyone. It's not good for participation. It's not good for government. Um, it's not good for accountability. And I, so, I, I mean, I think that's why at least the people who've spoken so far are very interested in trying to figure out a way to, for the government to be more accountable, um, for it not to be so beholden to one individual, um, and for it to be a little bit more fair. I mean, the, the, I mean, it, it is a major point for all of us that you know that you know basically the chief executive offices may be basically priced out of the average person, <laughs> um, and, and I don't think that's a good thing, but. It has gone the way it's gone. Um, I, I never thought, you know, we're not even the largest city in Connecticut. But it takes over a million dollars to be elected mayor. Um, and that That's not good for anyone. Um, and there may be other ways to, to solve that issue. But I mean, and, and I, um, but um, so when that, a person raises that kind of money, anybody who runs with him, right, on the same <laughs> You know, basically things they owe their politically livelihood to that individual. Um, and don't think those mayors don't use that. 
they do, particularly when they need a vote or what have you. They will remind people who got them elected, why, and you know what they want from them. Um, they're not always as blunt about it, but it, I mean, it's always there. So if you want an independent legislative body, you've got to do things and make them feel that they're politically independent. Um, I just think that's the only way to get it done. But yeah, I hear what you're saying on that, which is why we, in terms of getting voter participation, you have one big city election. We try to get everybody out at one time. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And, and, uh, I'm not necessarily offering up my own views here, but I'm trying to I'm trying no, to you know, open up a, a, a dialogue here. No, the other understood. the other the other question I have is, would it not be in the best interests of a mayor running um, during that time that there's the, the folks are up with districts to run his own slate uh, or his or her own slate um, within the within the district primaries? Um, I mean, I'll tell you why that's politically impossible. Um, no, ma no mayor, no matter how powerful that mayor is, controls all the districts in the city of Hartford, Democratic or otherwise. I mean, that's just um, the town committees themselves all get together um, and come up with their own candidates. Um, that process will probably be even more, um, more bare knuckle <laughs> um, than it has been in the past, I think, with, with the proposed changes. Um, so I don't, that doesn't concern me at all. Um, and I've seen the mayor try to have influence over state, over the state delegation and they laugh, um, because they know they got themselves elected, that the mayor didn't have a lot to do with it. And the mayors have tried to influence those processes very, unsuccess very unsuccessfully, even despite the change. And despite the fact that the mayor is well-known and, and raises a great deal of money, the mayor has not had a single effect on the, um, on the house races or the Senate races. Um, I think if someone told John Fonfair that the mayor got him elected, he'd laugh. <laughs> um, um, I think, you know, I know, I know Eric Coleman did. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, and Doug doesn't seem to be that, that fearful of the mayor either. I mean, the, the state house races themselves have been their own independent. They run separately, of course, but even when the mayor has sought and tried to have influence, it's been very ineffective. Um, the party chairman would have a much more, uh, would be more would be something that they that the uh, districts and the senators would listen to more so than the mayor because that person was actually gonna, can, can can help control the votes. Um, that's the only way the mayor could do that for the town committee, but he couldn't do it through just his electoral presence and with money. Not the way it's set up, anyway. My opinion. Okay, Commissioner Medina, and then uh, Commissioner Gallon Clark, and then Commissioner Rubenstein. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think to, to both your questions, I think um, I think it's why the conversation about how many um, districts we create is going to be critical, um, because I think, you know, you can look at this to Commissioner Kennedy's uh, concern around especially money and politics, you know, the kind of two forms of power, organized politics and organized people. But if we're creating districts that it makes it really difficult to organize people because they're they're too large, um, then I think then I think turnout could be a problem because you're not a, you know, you want to create small enough districts that candidate that incumbents and, and competitive challengers can reasonably knock on every door in their district. I think that's the ideal um, given that these races don't have any public funding and you want to make them manageable. Um, I think it would also encourage everyday people to actually think that they actually have a shot of winning an election and would want to engage in it more. Um, so that's why I was proposing, you know, I want to, in a, in, a, in a different conversation, go into more detail about exactly how many districts and how large they would be. Because I think as long as we're making them small enough so that they're competitive, it likely means it's more than six. Then I think turnout will, you know, on some of this year, we're relying on the, the people of Hartford to make a determination that they care about their government. Um, and if we're creating small enough districts that are inspiring people to turn out to vote, it's successful. And if people aren't turning out to vote, it's probably because the quality of the candidates and no one's knocking on doors. So that's, that's my view on it, I guess. Thank you, Commissioner Medina. Uh, Commissioner Gallon clark I had actually taken my hand down, but you know, oh. since you called on me, I just wanted to say that speaking from someone who works in a grassroots organization that's very close to the resident level, um, you, you have posed the scenario about the lower turnout if we um, did something differently as far as the voting. 
And the low turnout basically, you know, look at the last election, it wasn't due to um, folks just, what it was basically due, due to is folks that have just given up um, a sense of hopelessness, basically, that my vote doesn't matter. I think Commissioner Medina used the word as inspire. So there's a level of inspiration that's needed. There's a level of education and awareness that's needed where folks will actually get to the point to believe that my vote will make a difference. It's not gonna be the same old, same old. So it, it's not because of a difference of election. It's basically giving people the reason to hope again. And so I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rubenstein. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. <clears throat> it's um, my belief that Hartford, like most other big cities, should have a government that's equivalent to the face of the people in the community. And in uh, Connecticut in 2022, the top five cities by way of population all have white men as mayors. All of them, five of them, Bridgeport, Waterbury, New Haven, Hartford, Stanford as a white female. So that's what we got. I think it's wrong. And I think part of why it's wrong is because they did not locally safeguard, I think the um, ordinances and the use of the government in the way that would give a fair and equal uh, shot to other minority groups uh, or there were no controls over the amount of money. Now, I know New Haven has the pilot program that I've been interested in and talked about. And it's interesting that um, New Haven over their last, and Steve will know this, four or five um, mayors, two were Afro-American that, that I recall. And why? Because they have, I think, a public finance system. Uh, and I think you either have a public finance system or I suggest what attorney Kennedy and I suggested, which is to bifurcate the elections and have those elections in such a way that uh, nobody feels that the mayor is dominating. And uh, that's the only way, even though without the public finance part of the pilot program, anybody running for mayor can raise a million dollars, but that doesn't mean they necessarily win. But what it does mean is they have a leg up in, in the winning. Um, and um, that's my suggestion uh, for the reasons I've mentioned. I'd like to see the city of Hartford's government, meaning mayor, treasurer, and council look like the face of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubenstein. Any other questions, comments? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, sure, this is something that we'll be revisiting soon. Um, and so, right now, we're going to move on to our last agenda item, which will be mayoral issues, uh, temporary absence or disability. And this is a something that was a technical issue that was raised by uh, Howard Rifkin, the Corporation Council. Uh, Steve's going to just touch on it briefly. You just did. Uh, <laughs> I was I was going I was looking at it to see what the issue was. Uh, I don't think there's any specific issue with the substance of the section. Um, but I think the core council raised a legitimate question. And I'm not sure what we can do about it. Um, except maybe put a provision in uh, saying that um, if the charter has a provision saying that you need to adopt an ordinance, if you don't, uh, the entire council will be declared null and void and vacant. Uh, I don't know what you can do to mandate that they actually adopt the ordinance. Uh, I'm, I'm joking about it, but this is, a, this is something I've seen in uh, different cities. Um, because what I tried to do with the charters, I probably drafted that section. Um, what I try to do with the charters is to set the constitutional standard and to have one with um, the, uh, you know, what we might do is that um, we might put in here on the ordinance language because I've been changing it in some of my things 
say, if necessary, they should adopt an ordinance because the, se the section is pretty comprehensive. Um, um, and so if we put, if necessary, they can adopt an ordinance to deal with the procedure, then we eliminate the problem that, um, that I think that um, Howard uh, flagged for us, but it's a problem in a lot of communities. And I've been uh, taking a look at the sections in, in charters that I've written to see if I can modify it at all. I have one community that's gonna be doing a charter revision in the ne next couple of years. And there were three mandates uh, for elimination of three sections. Um, and they're still sitting there um, eight years later with a charter revision coming in two years. So I think I'll take a look at the sentence and see if I could add some language that makes it conditional. I'll, I'll make sure that the language is clear. I think it is clear. Um, and that maybe we say that if necessary, the council shall provide by ordinance a procedure to determine, you know, uh, to determine um, the effect, to effectuate the provision if necessary, something like that. Okay, and I see that Commissioner DeJesus. I saw that too. Yeah. But the before before we go to Commissioner DeJesus, is this the only part? Is this the only uh, clause in the charter where that calls on the uh, the council to take action where where they haven't taken action? I I I don't know the answer to that. I will. What I'll do is I'll do a run through the charter to see where else we mandate ordinances, and see whether the council has in fact. Um, adopted ordinances in that area. Okay, because one other option too would, regardless, I mean, even if we give them the option, um, maybe in our final report flagging for the council, here are some action items for you all that um, haven't been addressed, but you know should have been and may have been forgotten. I, I've done that uh, and we should do it again. <laughs> I've done that with, with councils over the years. I, I wanna remind everybody that um, since the charter was adopted, this form of charter was adopted in 2002, we have never modified the ordinances of the city of Hartford. So city manager still shows up throughout the code of ordinances. Um, and, and I think that um, I don't understand the laxity. I don't understand why um, that it never gets done. Um, it was actually, uh, Mayor Perez did start it uh, and then he ran into a few problems. And it was not continued thereafter, but uh, um, but uh, they're not good about staying on top of these things. Um, so I will take a run through it, and I think we should let the council know as part of our report. Great, Commissioner De Jesus. I am going to attempt it. I'm in an area where I have very bad reception. So if you guys can hear me, that'll be great. Um, so there is a recent uh, occasion where the mayoral uh, role has been distributed to the council president, and that has been in Stanford. Um, I don't know who I shared it with, but I'm not. Sh I'm almost quite sure that the charter speaks to it in Stanford. Um, my recollection was that the current mayor was going on paternity leave, and the um, and I think the vacancy, if it was more than 24 hours or so on and so forth or something like that, that uh, the council president will take over. Right? So that's more of what they would do. Here the issue is that we have a system. Hartford is a very active um, city. Council members are always, are like literally like our firefighters running from one incident to the other. And, and it's very difficult for them to, uh, and I find this, the past two decades, uh, in, in an example of this, the code has not been updated. Um, so I do see in certain areas, uh, until you know, we we create a culture where we go into our ordinance and, uh, and update them. I think that may be something that we could possibly uh, put into the charter, uh, as it's been something that has occurred uh, recently um, as to the secession. Um, and so, and that also goes to, to the question of if it is an ordinance and, and we don't have one now, if something was to happen, we can probably do an emergency ordinance. Um, those don't get done too often, but it usually takes about 60 days uh, to get those through. And sometimes it's not time, is the time and resources of corporation council. 
uh, that kind of slows that uh, that verbiage down, and, and then the negotiation comes to a council. Uh, I've seen a few ordinances get passed, you know, in a few weeks sometimes. It's through a special ordinance process, but those tend to be complicated. And I'm thinking if we do have something, uh, this incident will be a lot more difficult to deal with if there is a vacancy in the mayor's office, and then we have to rush to get this uh, language in, in place. So um, I'm almost sure that I think is Stanford that has that on their charter. So we can probably look at that. Uh, probably you guys can look at it as you go. I, can't, I don't have the facilities to do that right now. But uh, yeah, I think it's a crucial thing. And so we kind of build a culture where we're going to update ordinance and that we create ordinances. I thought that I counted upwards of 20 plus areas where mentions uh, that you can do ordinances and they're not being exercised. Um, so how we change that, it, it, it's, it's a cultural thing, you know. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Dejesus. Any other any other comments on this item, Commissioner Rubenstein? Yes, in my uh, other hat as uh, chair of the uh, audit committee a department within the city, although we're strictly autonomous, meaning we don't answer to anybody. The auditors answer to the commissioners, and I'm one of three of them. Um, the mayor um, had uh, certain health issues, um, had to be away, and in, and um, by letter, uh, he had uh, President Rosado jump in for him and uh, work uh, with the COO uh, for the time that he was um, indisposed, and it, and it worked well, though it was formal, informal, pardon me informal. So I would be in favor of something formalized. Uh, I like uh, what some of the folks have said about formalizing a um, system in the charter relative to the mayor's, uh, a mayor's uh, physical or mental uh, uh, well-being. I think there should be something in the charter. I would encourage the council and the chair to uh, look at other cities. Uh, we have some time uh, and they could even be cities outside the, uh, the state to see what, uh, what, it is, what we have, uh, what could work and bring it to uh, the body here at some point soon so that we can uh, look it over and see if we uh, can make a change. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubenstein. Steve, you have a comment? The mute is hard to take sometimes. Um, there are, um, Stanford does, um, vice chair is correct. Um, New Haven does, Hamden does, Bridgeport does. There, there are more robust disability provisions. And um, it, with, a, with your permission, with the chair's permission, I'll take a, a, a quick look at them and see how they work so that you have a sense of how they, they do in fact work. There, there, there are standards. Um, that would be set because the more difficult issue is in this, in Hartford recently, the mayor took the responsible step, did, did the right thing and, and uh, designated um, somebody under this provision to act um, on his behalf. Um, you could have a, a mayor who might not do that and would not be able to conduct the, uh, the government and have officials in his or her office doing it, which would be contrary to the intent of the charter. So. There is language. I'll be happy to provide it for you. Great. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Seeing no other comments on that item, um, we can move on to adjournment. I just want to give folks a heads up. At our next meeting, we'll be discussing um, boards and commissions and uh, council appointment authority. Uh, and then Steve will be giving us a briefing on chapter eight, which is the department and department heads and also chapter 11 borrowing. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Rubenstein. Um, when do you foresee that we'll take action on the treasurer's wish list? Sometime after next meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, 
And uh, seeing other questions without objection, we will stand adjourned. Thanks everyone. Thank you, have a good night.